Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. So what I'd like to do is show you how to solve trigonometric equations when involving multi-angles. So you can see in these equations, I have sine of 2x, cosine of 2x, and sine of 2x representing our multi-angles. Now, when we're going to find our solutions, all of our solutions are going to be between 0 and 2 pi. And previously, we've worked on solving trigonometric equations uh, you know, with one trig function using inverse operations, with multiple using factoring. Then we used uh, different functions with factoring, as well as using Pythagorean identities. So when we have something, when we see the multi-angles, the first thing it kind of triggers to me. Just like if you remember whenever when we were doing the solving for um, trigonometric equations with Pythagorean identities, whenever I see sine squared, cosine squared, tangent squared, or any of the reciprocal functions squared, I automatically think try to use your Pythagorean identities. And the exact same thing is going to come. When I see a trigonometric equation of multi-angles, I'm going to automatically think, well, let's use my multi-angle for let's use the multi-angle formula to go ahead and rewrite it and see how I can work with the equation from there. So that's exactly what I'm going to do here. The first thing, step I'm going to do is, again, you know, there's multiple ways to get through this. But if I have sine of 2x is equal to cosine of x, I'm going to use the multi-angle formula for sine of 2x, or the double angle formula for sine of 2x, to rewrite that. So the sine of 2x is equivalent to 2 sine of theta cosine of theta equals cosine, oops, using x's, not thetas, equals cosine of x. So now I can see everything's in terms of you know, sines and cosines. And if I was going to go ahead and solve this, since I have two different trig values, um, I'm going to have to get them to the same side and set it equal to 0 so I can use factoring. So I will subtract a cosine of x on both sides. And when doing that, I now obtain 2 sine, sine of x cosine of x minus cosine of x equals 0. Now you can see that, um, you know, because I can't just solve it. I had sines and cosines. So you just can't use inverse operations to solve for x because you have x attached with sine and cosine, which are not like, uh, which are not like terms and not the same trig function. So I'm going to have to use some sort of factoring. So I set them equal to 0. And now I see, all right, well, how can I factor this? Well, it's a binomial. So I want to see, you know, what do they have in common? You can see that both of these terms, both of these terms here have a cosine in common. So I am going to factor out a cosine of x. When factoring on a cosine of x, I'm left with 2 sine of x minus 1 equals 0. Now I have the product of two expressions set equal to 0. So now I can apply my 0 product property. So since you have this times this equals 0, that means 1 or both equals equal to 0. So I set them both equal to 0. So I say the cosine of x equals 0, or 2 sine of x minus 1 is equal to 0. Now I go ahead, this one's already solved. So this one, I'm just going to use my inverse operations here. Divide by 2. So I have sine of x equals 1 half. OK, so remember now to solve for x, though, we need to be able to um, find the values. Way so what we're doing is we're saying cosine of x is equal to 0. Remember, cosine represents the angle. So cosine of what angle equals 0? Well, the other way to really write this, because remember when you're solving, technically what you're doing is you're isolating the variable x. And x isn't technically isolated. So if you want to be technical, what we really need to do is take the inverse function on both sides. So take cosine inverse on both sides. That's going to get rid of, um, that's going to undo the cosine of your variable on the left side, leaving me with x equals cosine inverse of 0. And if I take the inverse sine of both sides, I get x equals sine inverse of 1 half. But a lot of times I just you know, say it out loud and say, all right, what exactly is this asking us? This is asking us the solutions to this equation are going to be the angle. When you take the cosine of an angle, you're equal to 0. Or when you take the sine of an angle, you're equal to 1 half. So to understand those solutions, what we're going to have to do is go back to the unit circle. All right, so we see when is cosine equal to 0? Well, we know that this point is 1 comma 0. So therefore, this point is going to be negative 1 comma 0. Well, here, cosine, remember, represents the x-coordinate. That's negative 1 over 1, so that's not going to work. So over here, we look at 0 comma 1 or 0 comma negative 1. Now, remember, our solutions have to be between 0 and 2 pi. That's only one revolution around our unit circle. So we actually have two values here. We have x is the, val the angle that x produce or that the x coordinate is 0 is going to be at my first angle here, which is pi halves, or 
3 pi halves. So I could say x is equal to pi halves, 3 pi halves. And now let's determine, well, when is sine equal to, when is the angle, when is the sine of an angle equal to 1 half? So we need to go through and determine, well, what is the angle that produces the y coordinate to be 1 half? And the first angle that we know is in the first quadrant. And that angle is pi over 6. Because that coordinate point is square root of 3 over 2, comma, 1 half. OK? So we could say it's also pi over 6 is an answer, right? Because the sine of pi over 6 is going to produce the y coordinate, which is 1 half. So sine inverse is basically asking what angle, when I take the sine of it, gives you 1 half. That's what sine inverse asks you. Then, remember, sine is not only positive in the first quadrant, but it's also positive in the second quadrant. So therefore, we also have this angle right here, which is going to produce the exact reflection of this, which would be negative square root of 3 over 2, comma, positive 1 half. And that angle is going to be 5 pi over 6. So therefore, that is going to be all of your solutions for the first problem. OK, so now let's go and get into the next one. Um, now, this, uh, this one is already in terms of cosine. But we kind of come up to a problem because if you remember, the, cosine, the double angle of a cosine has multiple different representations. I wrote them down over there just so I didn't forget them. You know, cosine of a double angle could be cosine squared of x minus sine squared of x. You could have 2 cosine squared of x minus 1. Or you could have 1 minus 2, <sighs> two sine squared of x. I'm about to sneeze, but I didn't know if it was going to come. So my thinking here is whenever we're solving, I like to solve only with one variable. I don't, I mean, this is fine. This worked out when you have sines and cosines. But if you have an opportunity to keep it or to rewrite it in terms of one trigonometric function, then do it. So I'm going to choose the trigonometric function that is going to keep, on, that is going to be only in terms of cosine, which is 2 cosine squared of x minus 1. So I'm going to rewrite cosine of 2x as 2 cosine squared of x minus 1 cosine of x plus 1 is equal to 0. Now, it's already said equal to 0, which is nice. Um, and we also know that we have a cosine squared and cosine. Those are not like terms, so we cannot combine them. So therefore, it's going to basically bring up, again, factoring. But before I even get to factoring, because you might say, ooh, it's a trinomial, um, before we get into factoring, let's combine our terms. And what we notice is minus 1 and, at, and plus 1, those add up to 0. So I'm actually just left with 2 cosine squared of x plus cosine of x equals 0. Now, um, when we're going through this, then now it's very similar to what we did over here. We can just factor by grouping. Or not factor by grouping, but factor out the GCF. So you can see that they both share a cosine of x. So I'm going to factor out a cosine of x. And when I do that, I'm left with 2 cosine of x plus 1 equals 0. OK, so now I can apply my zero product property. And I could say cosine of x is equal to 0, or 2 cosine of x plus 1 is equal to 0. This is already set equal to 0. Subtract 1, subtract 1. 2, two cosine of x equals negative 1. Then I divide by 2, divide by 2. Cosine of x equals negative 1 half. So, this problem is very similar to uh, the last one we did. We have cosine of x. So we know those two solutions are going to be pi halves and 3 pi halves. I don't have to do, redo that. However, in this one, we had sine of 1 half. right? Remember, sine represents the y coordinate. Well, now we're looking at, well, for cosine of what angle is going to produce negative 1 half? Technically, you could take the cosine inverse of both sides to have our variable isolated. But basically, what you're looking for is the cosine of what angle produces negative 1 half. Basically, the cosine of our, when, what angle has the x coordinate of negative 1 half. So again, we go back to the unit circle and say, all right, for the angle pi over 6, that produced a y coordinate of 1 half. So what angle, again, produces a x coordinate of 1 half? Well, I know we're looking for negative 1 half, but I just want to show you at least. The first quadrant, that angle is pi over 3. And remember, that angle is 1 half comma square root of 3 over 2. Now I'm showing you this just so you can see that our angle, our solutions, are going to be in terms of pi over 3 because that's, the angle, that's what 1 half is in for x. Now we're looking for the negative version. Well, cosine is going to be negative in the second and the third quadrant. So we're looking for the angle right here 
and right here. Well, if that's pi over 3, then that is 2 pi over 3. This would be 3 pi over 3, and then this angle is 4 pi over 3. Okay, so now I can write my solutions here, and I can just write x equals pi halves, 3 pi over 2. That was the solutions for x equals 0 from my last problem. And then I'm going to add 2 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3. And there you go. All right, um, let's get into the last one here. Uh, now I have a sine of 2x and cosine of x equals cosine of x. And again, so basically the first thing we're going to want to do is rewrite sine of 2x um, at using our double angle formula. And the other thing I'm going to want to do is, since I know that I have sine of x and cosine of x, I'm also going to want to get the co I'm going to want to set it equal to 0. Because until you set things, until you get rid of that and set it equal to 0, um, until you set it equal to 0, you can't apply factor. You can only use factor. You can only use the zero product property when you have a product of expressions equal to 0. So let's actually subtract cosine of x on both sides. Then I'm going to rewrite sine of 2x as 2 sine of x times um, 2 sine of x cosine of x times sine of x minus cosine of x equals 0, because that goes to 0 now. Now what you can see here is I can actually multiply the sines of x. So I'm left with 2 sine squared of x cosine of x minus cosine of x equals 0. So to go ahead and look at this into factoring, what I can do is basically I see that both of these expressions have a cosine, uh, cosine of x in common. So I'll factor out a cosine of x. That's going to leave me with a 2 sine squared of x minus 1 equals 0. Now I apply my zero product property. So I have cosine of x equals 0, which I am familiar with, right? A cosine of x equals 0, and then a 2 sine squared of x minus 1 equals 0. Now this one's going to have a little bit, couple, a little bit more inverse operations. It's going to take a little bit more work for us. So I'll add 1 to both sides. Here I have 2 sine squared of x equals 1. Then I divide by 2. And that's going to leave me with a sine squared of x equals 1 half. Now, to undo the squaring, I take the square root of both sides. And remember, when you take the square root of both sides, you've got to make sure you include the um, plus or minus. So I have plus or minus. When I'm taking the square root, what I can do is um, take the square root of the numerator and denominator separately. So the square root of 1 is 1 over the square root of 2. However, we don't like to write our answer with the square root in the denominator. So I'll rationalize my denominator here. And I'm left with 2. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm left with square root of 2 over 2. I'm sorry, plus or minus, right? OK, so that's going to be something very important to remember. So now it's plus or minus. So we've talked about the angle pi over 3. We talked about the angle pi over 6. Now we're looking for the angle. And I'm going to save a little space. I'm not going to take the inverse sine of both sides. But basically what I'm asking you is the sine of what angle produces plus or minus the square root of 2 over 2. Well, we looked at the angle pi over 3. And here's your x and here's your y coordinate. We looked at the angle pi over 6, and here's your x and your y coordinate. Um, so the only angle that we did not discuss, also that's a very common angle, is your angle pi over 4. And at the angle pi over 4, you have square root of 2 over 2 comma square root of 2 over 2. OK? Um, so we're looking for the positive and negatives. Well, sine is going to be positive in the first and second quadrant, and it's going to be negative in the third and the fourth quadrant. And it's all going to be in terms of pi over 4. So we know that, let's go and write down the solutions we do know, which is when cosine of x is equal to 0. So that is pi halves. Actually, let's write this down here. So x equals pi halves, 3 pi halves. Then we know that pi over 4 is 1, pi over 4. So it would be pi over 4, 2 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4. 4 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4. 6 pi over 4, 7 pi over 4. And there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That is going to be all of your solutions when solving a trigonometric equation between 0 and 2 pi using your multi, using multi angles or your double angle formula. Thanks. Formulas.
Ah. <sighs>